That's what God wants us to be here in Memphis, Tennessee. We need to be a catalyst for spiritual awakening, and we do that by loving Jesus Christ. Good morning and thanks for joining us for today's program. Today we'll be picking back up in our series through the book of Acts. Have your Bibles ready and join us as we learn how God worked through the New Testament church. We'll also be joining Donna Gaines for her spring Bible study series, Home Builders, Embracing the Art of the Home. And we'll enjoy some great worship from our choir, orchestra, and worship band. And if you're looking for encouragement to get through the week or want to catch up on recent messages, go online and check out our audio and video on demand at Bellevue.org. You can also follow us on social at Bellevue Memphis throughout the week for inspirational and encouraging stories. I'll see you in just a few minutes with more information about today's program and how you can get connected right here at Bellevue. Good morning, church. Would you stand together? Let's worship the Lord.
Each week, our ladies come together for a time of encouragement, worship, and Bible study led by Donna Gaines and other gifted teachers, and you are always welcome. This semester, we are learning how to skillfully build stable homes and how to establish them on a righteous foundation. Stay with us for the next few minutes for our study on home builders, embracing the art of the home. This past week, you've been studying about prayer. And so today, we're going to talk about how we can utilize the Word of God to ignite and hopefully reinvigorate your prayer life. You know, sometimes we... When we think about prayer, instead of getting excited, we feel guilty. Because all of us know that we should be praying, and yet a lot of us, like me included, go through seasons where I know I'm not praying as much as I should. I'm not spending as much time in the presence of God. And sometimes I allow other things to distract me and to suck up my time that I should be spending with the Lord. And then God will draw me to himself and through his sweet and tender spirit remind me that my time with him is not an option, that it is a necessity for me to be able to walk in the spirit, to be in tune with him, to walk and talk with him on a daily basis, for he is my lifeline. Ian Bounds said, the word of God is the food by which prayer is nourished and made strong. Psalm 119, 105 says that God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Moses told the children of Israel that they were to take to heart every word he commanded them. Because he said, this word is your life. Over and over again, we get a clear biblical picture that God's word is a life and death matter. Like a sword in the hand of a soldier, it needs to become second nature. So I want us to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 briefly as we think about how prominent the word should be in our lives our physical lives, but also in our physical homes if we're really going to be able to make God's Word a part of our lives, a part of our prayer lives, if we're going to build our life upon it. What does Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. So how do we get them on our heart? By spending time reading God's Word, meditating upon it, memorizing it, it becomes a part of us. And when it becomes a part of your heart, it renews and changes your mind. Then we are to teach them diligently to our sons and daughters and talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So basically God's word is not only to saturate our lives but to saturate our physical homes as well, right? So what we're going to talk about this morning is a way to pray through the scripture as you're reading it or also to pray through it by looking at some of the Psalms each day and take the Word of God and turn it back into prayers. And as you read these verses and meditate upon them and turn them into prayers, you're going to be surprised at the things God will bring into your mind to pray for, the people He will remind you of, things that maybe you didn't have in your prayer notebook, something He'll bring to mind, maybe something you need to ask Him to forgive you for, something you need to confess that you weren't even aware of, a wrong attitude, a wrong motive. God will show you an area maybe where you've been being selfish or holding back in some area. God will speak to you as you're getting into His Word. Why? Because it pierces down between the division of soul and spirit. God uses his word to get into the innermost parts of our being, the places he alone has access to. So if you're reading the word of God and turning his word into prayer, you better believe the spirit of God is going to be speaking to you. So listen, listen, be in tune with his spirit as he's prompting you about specific things, people, situations to pray for as you're working through that psalm. Donald Whitney says, so basically what you're doing is taking words that originated in the heart and mind of God and circulating them through your heart and mind back to God. By this means, his words become the wings of your prayers. One promise that Steve and I have prayed for our children and grandchildren is Isaiah 49 verse 21. It says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. So this is a covenant. This is God's will and purpose for us. 
My spirit, which is upon you, and my words, which are in your mouth, will not depart from your mouth, nor the mouths of your children, or offspring, nor the mouths of your children's children, forever. Steve has challenged us to at least pray for the next three generations of our own families. This is a great promise to claim. And what did we read last week, the quote that was so powerful from F.B. Meyer? God's promises are our inventory of provision. If God has promised it, he will provide it if we will believe. If we will take God at his word and claim his covenant promises. Now, I want you to think about your own personal prayer time. Some of you are going to be honest and you're going to say, you know what, I'm kind of in a rut. Or my prayer time is stale. Or I'm kind of tired of praying the same old things about the same old things every single day. And obviously there are some people and some things you're going to pray for every day. But if you begin to pray scripture, God is going to give you a fresh way of praying and a new awareness of ways to pray, even as you're praying for your family. So what I have done is I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer what it actually should be called. And we're going to break down the model prayer into basically specific um, categories that Christ covered in this model prayer of things that we should pray about. And under each one of these, we're going to list a psalm or two that you could utilize in praying through this. Now, obviously, this is a suggestion. You get alone with the Lord and his word, and you begin to pray as he directs you to. But I know sometimes it helps to have a handle. It helps to have a way to change things up a little bit. So you can start with this, and if God leads you to do something else, that's great. As long as you're praying, it doesn't really matter. Because prayer is our lifeline to God. It is how we experience his presence, his intimacy. As we open his word, as we commune with him, prayer is a conversation. You would not have a conversation with one of your best friends or with a spouse by coming to them with a list of all the things you want them to do. And yet that's how we approach God. We come to him with our list of things we want him to do for us, and we very rarely pause long enough to listen for him to respond or to give direction or to even show us how we might be praying in a way that won't be best for us or for that person. And instead, when we get into his word, he begins to open our eyes. So in Matthew chapter 6, let's actually begin with verse 5. Jesus said, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What is he saying? Where is the father? The father is in your secret place. The father is waiting there to meet with you. And whether you actually go into your closet and you have a war room closet like the movie, or you have, like I do, a chair in the corner of a room, or maybe it's the end of your couch, wherever you get alone with God, that becomes your secret place, your time alone with the Lord, your place where you expect to experience his presence and to be intimate with him. We're going to close this morning, and I want you to open your Bibles to Psalm 23. Now I'm going to give you five minutes to pray through this psalm. For some of you, you may not get beyond the Lord is my shepherd and thanking him for being the good shepherd. It doesn't matter. Go as slowly as you want to as you work through it. And I just want you to practice what we've talked about this morning. And remember that when you pray, You are entering that throne room of brilliance beyond our imagination. Know that he is God. Father, meet with us, we pray, as we open your word and allow your words to put wings on our own prayers. In Jesus' name we pray.
You came for criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites, even ones like me. Sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all I've done, nailed into your hand. Oh, your love, that for me, oh, your blood in crimson street. Bibles and turn with me, please. We're going back to Acts now. We're going to finish this wonderful book this spring, and I want to talk to you today from Acts chapter 21, beginning at verse 15, and we will go over into chapter 20. Acts chapter 21, verse 15. I'll be reading that momentarily, and I want to talk to you today about effective witnessing. You know, if you love somebody, I've told you this many times, you talk about them. And if you love Jesus, you'll talk about him. If Jesus is in your heart, he'll come out of your mouth. 
The Apostle Paul was coming back from his third missionary journey. He was bringing a large offering back to the Jews in Jerusalem who had become Christians because many of them were living in poverty. We don't know why. Maybe it was because they had become Christians and they had lost their jobs. But there was a financial problem among the Christians in Jerusalem. So the Gentile Christians took up a large offering for them, and Paul, with several others, brought it back to them. And when he gave that offering to them, the senior pastor, the brother of Jesus, James the Just is what they called him, James the Just, he met Peter there, and he, or he met Paul there, and he said, Paul, uh, thank you for the offering. See how many thousands upon thousands there are of the Jews who have believed in Jesus, but there's a problem. They keep hearing that you are talking negatively about Judaism out on your missionary journeys. They're hearing that you don't think that people ought to be, when they get saved, they, they don't have to be circumcised. They, uh, they, they, they hear that uh, you don't believe in keeping the law. What are we going to do? And so there's this big problem, and you see Paul comes back. All he wants to do is tell people about Jesus. That's all he wants to do. And yet he has to give and take with people all the time so that he has that opportunity. So I want you to see today in one of the, to me, one of the best parts of Acts right here, there's no bad part in it, about requirements for effective witnessing. We're going to cover quite a bit of Scripture here, but I believe you will see that it is very applicable to you and to me right now, right here. First is this, effective witnessing requires what I refer to as deference. We must become all things to all people. Deference means that you defer to someone. You willingly defer to them. You try to accommodate them. You have to have that spirit if you're going to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 21 of Acts. Look at verse 15. After these days we got ready, we started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us. When Paul comes back after his third missionary journey, Peter and all the other apostles have left. They're out on their own missionary journeys. And we don't have a lot in the Bible about all that, but we do know that they went other places. And history tells us that many of them, if not all of them, were martyred, but they went out telling people about Christ. And so James is left, and he's the senior pastor here in the church at Jerusalem. Look at verse 19. After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things, this is Paul, which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. I love this. He gives a missionary report, and he brags on the Lord. He doesn't brag about himself. He said, this is what God has done among the Gentiles through our ministry. And then verse 20 says, when they heard it, they began glorifying God. They said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? That is, thousands upon thousands of Jews have become Christians, and they're all zealous for the Lord. They reverently, unwaveringly practice circumcision. They revere and obey the law, the first five books of the, of the Bible, the Torah, if you will. And you remember what Paul said about them in Romans chapter 2, these people, he said, for I testify about them that they have a zeal for God. That's what they said. They're zealous for the law. They have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. You know, there's a lot of people with a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Muslims have a zeal for God, but not in accordance to knowledge. Jehovah Witnesses have a zeal for God, but not in accordance to knowledge. Zeal alone is not enough. Now, if you know Jesus, you'll have zeal. But you can have zeal and not know Jesus. And these people, they did know Jesus, but their zeal was somewhat mistaken because they believed, still believe, even after chapter 15, even after all that they had discussed about the Gentiles not having to be circumcised and all this, back in chapter 15, they're still struggling with it, and there's still a bunch of them that said, no, 
In order to be a Christian, you have to first become a law-abiding Jew. Look at verse 21. He says, they have been told about you, Paul. This is James talking to him. That you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. That is the, the Old Testament law, the Pentateuch, the Torah. Telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. They, they were circling, circling rumors against Paul. They hated him. They wanted him to go down. They wanted to undermine his ministry. So they either told half-truths, truths or outright lies. And, you know, someone as well said, even though a rumor does not have a leg to stand on, it can still run mighty fast. Pastor James had, su had a suggestion. He thought it could help out. He's trying to help out. Look at verse 22. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear, Paul, that you've come. Therefore, do this that we may tell you that, that we may tell you, we have four men who are under a vow. This is a Nazaritic vow. You can read about it in James chapter 6. It was a vow that either a man or a woman could take to sanctify and separate themselves to the Lord for various religious reasons. Perhaps these men had become ceremonially unholy because maybe they along the way in the marketplace has rubbed up against a Gentile. That made them unholy. And so now they're taking a Nazaritic vow and it lasted seven days, and they were coming on the eighth day, they would shave their heads, bring an offering to the Lord. These men that James were talking about were Christians, but they were still coming to these Nazaritic vows, and they were about to shave their heads. And James says, why don't you get in there with them, shave your head, and everybody will know that you're a law-abiding Jew, not just a Christian evangelist. He says that in verse 24, take them and purify yourselves along with them and pay their expenses so they may, they may shave their heads. And all will know that there's nothing to these things which they've been told about you, but you yourself also walk accordingly, keeping the law. This is not the first time Paul has done something like this. If you go back to Acts chapter 18, verse 18, it says that Chintria, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. What is Paul doing when he does this? He is deferring to his fellow Jews in order to build bridges to them. He is dying to himself. We don't even think about that anymore. He is not being selfish. He doesn't believe that this has anything to do really with anything except to build a bridge with his fellow Jew who is a weaker person, if you will, in his belief system. But Paul was saying, I will be all things to all men here. Look at verse 25. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, James says, you remember all that we talked about in chapter 15, we wrote, having decided that they should abstain from meat sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men. The next day he purified himself along with them. He went into the temple. He gave notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Paul did not believe this, this was cleansing his sins. Paul was simply trying to, to not just go along to get along, but he was trying to defer so that he could win more people to faith in Jesus Christ. He was deferring, if you will, to the weaker brother. And every one of us ought to be willing to do that in order to win more people to faith in Jesus Christ. What's Paul doing? Don't you remember what he wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 9? Can't you hear it now? For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all. Where is that in the body now? We want our rights. Paul said, I don't have any rights. I make myself a slave to all so that I may win more. That's the bottom line. To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law. Though not being myself under the law so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, that's the Gentiles, as without law. Though not being without the law of God but under the law of Christ so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. And here it is, I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake 
of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. That's more important than you having your way or me having my way. Churches and Christians must use deference, putting lost people first in order to win them to Christ. If you refuse this approach, you're not only short-sighted, but you're selfish. The gospel of Jesus never changes, but sometimes you have to use new methods to reach people in this day. God, God is an innovator, if you will. He is somebody that will put a fresh thing. God is all about doing new things. One of the dangers of getting older is just relying on experience when God may be wanting to do a brand new thing in your life. Hear me today. You have to defer. You can't always say, this is the way we've done it. This is the way we do it. This is the way my mother did it and my parents did it and my grandparents did it. We've always done it this way at this church and if you don't like it, Go somewhere else. And you know what? They will. And you'll be sitting there one day alone holding the key and you're the last one standing. And you'll give it to some church that wants to grow. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, deference, being all things to all people is a must for a soul winner. I got more to say about that, but I'll go to number two. Effective witnessing requires determination. Not just deference. Not only must we become all things to all people and defer to other people, but we must also be determined. We must anticipate opposition and persecution. And you'd better be anticipating that in America. Look at chapter 21, verse 27. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, James said, oh, just go to the temple. It'll be a great idea. Bad idea, James. They saw him in the temple. They began to stir up all the crowd. They laid their hands on them. This was not ordination. (laughs) Crying out, men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. Besides, he's even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. This was a very serious charge against Paul. The Jews not only accused him of opposing and rejecting Jewish religious rites and rules, they also accused him of bringing a Gentile into the court of Israel, and that was a capital offense. Even the Romans said, you Jews, if, if, if somebody brings a Gentile into the court of Israel, you have our permission. Even if they're a Roman citizen, you have our permission to put them to death. I mean, it's a serious thing that they're accused. They saw Trophimus with him earlier, and they said, well, surely he brought this, this guy from Ephesus, this Gentile, into the temple. And there, there, were, there were warning signs all around this court. You can go to the court of the Gentiles, but if you cross this line, we will kill you if you're a Gentile. Don't do it. I mean, Paul was in trouble. He was in trouble. Look at verse 30. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of him, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Isn't that something? The temple doorkeepers did not want the beating of Paul in the inner court to disturb and interrupt their worship in the inner court. Well, that was so sweet of them. But by divine providence, God had somebody ready, a pagan guy, to rescue Paul. And he was the head of the Roman forces. Look at verse 31. While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. At once, he took along some soldiers They'd come from the area called Antonian, and the centurions, and they ran down to them. The centurions meant there were at least 200 soldiers with them. It's plural there. They ran down to them, and when they saw the commander, that is the Jews that were beating Paul, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up, took hold of him, ordered him to be bound with two chains. He began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. I've been to a few Baptist business meetings like this. The, the crowd was shouting one thing and some another. And when he could find, not find out the facts, 
because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When he got to the stairs, this is the stairs leading out of the temple area, going back to where the soldiers were, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob, for the multitude of the people kept following him, them shouting, away with him, away with him. Paul had done everything that James had told him to do, but instead of helping him, it hurt him. He had gone to the temple, he had fulfilled the Nazaritic vow, but instead of the Jews applauding, they attacked him. But Paul was determined. He had been beaten before. He had been stoned before. He had been stoned, I believe, to death before, and God raised him back from the dead. This is not the first time. This is not his first rodeo, if you will. This is not the first time this guy has been through the ringer. He was a man of Holy Spirit determination. He knew that he should anticipate opposition and persecution. There are Christians all over the world that are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. But you know what you've got to do when you are persecuted with the Holy Ghost in you? You can persevere and you can be a strong witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be determined. I'm not going to let the devil or the world win. I'm not going to be in any way, in any fashion, in any slight mood. I'm not going to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell people about Jesus until I go home. Home, I'm going to be determined to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, number three. I'm leaving out a lot, but that's okay. Effective witnesses, not only witnessing requires deferring and determination, but also declaration. You've got to get around to where you tell people about the Lord. You must share your testimony for Jesus. Now look down in verse 37 in chapter 21. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? And obviously he was speaking in Greek because the Roman guy speaks. He said, do you, do you know Greek? And it was obviously very learned Greek. Paul was a scholar. We don't remember that a lot of times. He was a brilliant person. And he spoke several languages, including Greek and Hebrew, very well educated, very, speaking very sophisticated Greek here in a manner that arrested the attention of this Lysias, this Roman commander. And then the commander says, then you're not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins into the wilderness. Josephus said there were 20 or 30,000 of these men, but he said there were, Luke says there's only 4,000 of them. And, and what he does, he, say, he, he thinks for a minute, he, he had thought that this Egyptian guy that had come earlier and called himself a prophet, and he had led 4,000 Jews, Jewish men, up to the Mount of Olives. And he said, now look, when I say the word, the walls of Jerusalem are going to collapse and we'll go in and we'll kill all the Romans and we'll set Jerusalem free from Roman bondage. Well, they all gathered over on that hill and Felix, the governor that would follow Pilate, sent a Roman group over there and killed a bunch of them. They scattered. This guy fled. And so Lysias, the commander here, thinks that this is this guy coming back. And Paul said, I am not that guy. I am not that crazy Egyptian. No, that's not me. In fact, I am a blue-blooded Jew. Here's what he says in verse 39. Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul stands up. Now, he had impressed this guy with Greek. Now he's about to impress the listeners who are Jews with Hebrew. Watch this, standing up on the stairs, motioning to the people with his hand. It says that over and over. I'd like to see what that motion is. I don't know if it's like, I don't know what it is, but something Paul did when he spoke. He motioned with his hands, and the Bible said, listen to this, the Bible says, when they, there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect. And he says, in verse 20, verse, chapter 21, verse 1 now, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer 
to you. These are the same exact words that Deacon Stephen used back in chapter 7, verse 2, when he was giving his speech in the same area, and he would die. Stephen would die. Same opening words. Hear my defense, which I now offer to you, verse 2. And when they had heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet, and he said, I'm a Jew. I was born in Tarsus of Cilicia. I was brought up in this city. I was educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as you also are today. I persecuted this way, talking about Christianity, to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the high council and the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were with who were there, talking about the Christians, to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened. I like that. That's always in the book of Acts. It happened. It happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. Who is this light? The Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world, John 8, 12. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice, heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, Why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus the Nazarene whom you're persecuting. Don't miss this. It's the most important moment up to this point in Paul's life. He had been saying, Jesus is a hoax. Jesus is a fake. Jesus was crucified. And because Deuteronomy says that anybody crucified is under the curse of God, Jesus cannot be the Messiah because he was crucified and he's buried and he did not rise from the dead. And the very Jesus that Paul denied had risen from the dead, denied was the Messiah, now is standing there looking at him and he's saying, hey, I am alive. I am the Messiah. Why are you persecuting me? Don't you love that? When you touch the people of God, you touch God himself. When you touch the church, you touch the Christ. Jesus said, you're you're hurting me. You're persecuting me when you hurt my people and kill them. I am Jesus the Nazarene. All of a sudden, Paul realizes Jesus, who'd been crucified and had died, was alive. And Paul continues his testimony. Verse 9 Those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? He said, get up. Go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. We know, according to other texts and acts, exactly where he went. He went to the house of a man named Judas on Straight Street. Then God sent a soul winner named Ananias to share the gospel with him so he could get saved. Look at verse 12. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standards of the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, standing near, said to me, Brother Saul, this was the brother reference as a fellow Hebrew, as a fellow Jew. He was not referring to him as a Christian. Paul did the same thing in Acts chapter, uh, or in Romans chapter 9, when he says, my heart's desires for my brethren, the Jews who are lost, is that they would be saved. He said, I'd die and even forfeit my salvation if they could be saved. He called them brethren, but they weren't brethren as Christians. They were brothers as in Jews. Paul was not converted yet either. Look at verse 13. Receive your sight, Ananias said. At that very moment, I looked up at him. He said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one, to hear the utterance from his mouth. For you will be, not yet, but you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. He was not a witness yet for Christ, but he was about to be. And here we see Ananias urge him persuade him, not manipulate him, but urge him to be saved right then and there. Look at verse 16. To me, one of the most important verses in the whole book of Acts. Now, why do you delay? 
There's something that Baptist preachers are stopping to do. They don't want to urge anybody to get saved anymore. They are so afraid of manipulating somebody that they don't want to press in and say, you need to be saved right now. Let me just tell you where I am on that right now. Look at me. You need to be saved right now if you're lost. You don't need to wait to the end of this sermon. You don't know if Jesus is going to come back. You need to give your heart to Christ even while I'm preaching this sermon. Don't wait. I persuade you. I don't manipulate you, but I beg you. I urge you. It is Time is running out. You don't have all the time you think you do. You're going to be standing before God, and if you didn't stand before Him without Jesus, you're going to die and go to hell. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. But if you come to Christ and repent of your sins and believe savingly in Jesus, whosoever, I don't care what you've done, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I urge you, be saved today. That's what he's saying. He said, why do you delay? Why do you delay? Why? Why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Wouldst thou be saved? Oh, why not tonight? Why don't we sing songs like that anymore? And this shows me right here, Paul was not yet saved. Look at this. Get up. Be baptized. Now watch. Wash away your sins, calling on His name. Say it with me. Wash away your sins, calling on His name. Paul didn't have his sins washed away yet. You're not saved if you don't have your sins washed away. Now why are you shouting Brother Steve, because nowadays people say he got saved on the road to Damascus. Take the Bible, show me, show me that. It doesn't say he got saved there. He got saved right here, verse 16. He called upon the name of the Lord, and his sins were washed away. Why is that important? Because God did not zap him with a sovereign bolt of grace, as some people call salvation. That's not how you get saved. You get saved, God offers you the gospel. You voluntarily repent and you believe. That's what Paul did. That's what Paul did. Paul got saved right here. He got straightened out on straight street. He did not get saved on the road. He got saved not on the road, not on the way to Damascus, but at Damascus. It happened. Verse 17, when I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple. I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, this is Jesus talking to Paul three years after he got saved, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison, beat those who believe in you. When the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I was also standing by approving. I was watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And Jesus said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now watch this. Verse 22, they listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices. They said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he does not, should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks, tossing dust into the air. Paul gave his testimony, but they would have none of it. But you know what? It's okay. You give your testimony, even if they laugh at you. I heard, well, I heard about a man the other day that got saved recently, about to get baptized. I think he's getting baptized today. He was in Walgreens or someplace like that. He was witnessing to a veteran, and the veteran said, where was your Jesus when all of my people got killed and everything? And there were 12 people in the whole line listening to him talk about this. And he tried to share the gospel with the guy, and the guy would have none of it. So he turns around and said, well, what about y'all? Anybody want to be prayed for? Four or five people said, I do. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Don't you be ashamed of Jesus Christ. And if somebody rejects you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. But the good thing about it is Paul's hands were clean from the blood of these people. I can give you a lot more verses, but declaration, you got to have that. Share your testimony. What is effective witness against deference, becoming all things to all people, determination, anticipating opposition and persecution, declaration, sharing your testimony for Christ. And one more thing, dependence, trust in God to provide, to guide and provide and protect. Let me just read verses 24 through 30. 
The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging. Jesus had been scourged so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. You know what? God already had a means of protection. Watch this. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful? I can, I can just see it. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? And I can see that guy go, whoa, major offense. You don't scourge a Roman, and you sure don't scourge one who has not had a fair trial. And they could have been inflicted with the very scourging they were about to give if they had illegally scourged Paul. They came this close to being in major trouble. And so Paul leverages the fact that he is a Roman citizen, and God used that providentially and sovereignly to get him out of the trouble. But when they stretched out the thongs, that's what happened. And verse 26 when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander. He said, why are you about, what are you about to do? This man's a Roman. The commander came to him and said, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The commander said, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. Paul said, I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. The commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman because he had put him in chains. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him. He ordered the chief priest and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. And Paul would give a great witness. All I can tell you is this, Proverbs 16 verse 9 says, we can make our plans, but God determines our steps. You depend on the Lord, and you can trust God to guide and protect you even when you share the gospel. Now, I want you to take out, you, you got your pencils. If you don't, take one out. If some of y'all just been doing this the whole time are saying, write that down, Martha. Write that down. Write that down. No, stop it. You write it down, all right? All of us. Here we go. What would happen if all of us started praying for one lost person? Let's pray for it. Let's, for the rest of the year, let's pray, let's pray for one lost person, at least one, that they'll be convicted of sin and that they'll call upon the name of the Lord. You start praying for one lost person. And then, number two, ask God to help you share your testimony at least once a week. It doesn't have to be long. We were walking out of a workout area the other night, Don and I were. It was late at night. Four young teenage boys walking out right by us. I said, I was about y'all's age when I got turned on to the Lord. And I just gave a brief testimony, and I got in the car and felt like I'd done what the Lord wanted me to do. Don't ever be ashamed to brag on Jesus. Don't always take the initiative. Don't wait on them. Go on and take the initiative. Just, just say, I'm going to share my testimony. And then thirdly, ask God to give you the opportunity to share the gospel this year and lead somebody to Jesus. Pray for people, share your testimony, share the gospel. Will you do it? Thank you so much for watching this broadcast today. And I know that you've heard so much from the Word of God, and the Word of God is so powerful. But I just want you to hear one more time that God loves you. He created you in His image. He knows you, and He loves you with an everlasting love. That's what the Scripture says. But the Bible also says that all of us are sinners. We have broken the laws of God. That's exactly what sin is, breaking God's laws. And just like when you break man's laws, you get in trouble, there's a penalty for that. There's a penalty for breaking God's laws. The Bible says the just penalty or the wages of sin is death, spiritual separation from God. And even though God loves us, He hates sin. He loves sinners, but He hates sin, just like we love our children, but we don't love it when they disobey us. That is the way it is with God. And so God is holy, He hates sin, and He tells us because we are sinful, we're separated from Him, but He loved us too much to leave us separated from Him. So He came to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was born of a virgin, consequently, free from a sinful nature. He had always existed in eternity past, but He came to this earth through the womb of a virgin. And He was made in the likeness of men, the Bible says. 100% man, 100% God simultaneously. 
And the Bible says when he grew older, he was tempted and always like we are, but he never yielded to temptation. He never sinned. But even though he never sinned, he went to the cross and died as an atoning sacrifice for you and for me. And then he was buried to prove that he was dead. But I thank God on that third day after he died, Jesus rose bodily, victoriously, and eternally from the grave. And he's alive now. And he offers you eternal life. How do you receive it? Number one, you repent of your sins. You turn from your sins and you turn to the Lord by the help of the Holy Spirit. And then you believe that Jesus died for you and that Jesus rose from the dead to give you eternal life. And then you don't just repent and believe, you receive. You invite Jesus to come into your life. Would you like to do that right now? I believe that some of you would like to repent, believe, and receive Jesus right now. If you would, pray with me. Say something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I am a sinner. You are the Savior. I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin. I turn to you, Lord Jesus. I believe you died for me on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead. I receive you now. Come into my life. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. Wash me and cleanse me. Thank you for being my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you so much for watching today. And may the Lord Jesus Christ help you to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. If you're in need of spiritual help, call us at 1-866-347-5431. There are caring people waiting right now to take your call. For more information about Bellevue, explore our website at bellevue.org, where you can catch up on recent messages from Pastor Steve and other great teachers through our audio and video on demand. And tune into our live webcast every Sunday at 9.20 and 11 a.m. and Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Follow us on social media at Bellevue Memphis throughout the week for inspirational and encouraging stories. We'd also like to invite you to join us for worship at one of our four locations around Memphis. Our main campus is located at I-40 in Appling Road. You're always welcome and there's a place for your family to worship and connect. Check out Bellevue.org for a complete list of worship times. We look forward to seeing you soon.